morning, everyone. You're welcome to Bible study. This is I Believe Bible Fellowship. We're in Houston, Texas, and we're a bunch of believers who love the Lord unashamedly and unreservedly. We study scriptures line upon line, precept upon precept, like the Bible says, verse by verse, because we believe no one buys a book in terms of all the chapters, paragraphs, and the sentences in it. But you read from start to finish, that way you are able to understand the contents of the book and hopefully the mind of the author. We are in the book of Second Kings, and I believe we are going to pick it up this morning on chapter 7. It's been an interesting study thus far. Trust that God will continue to give us insight and understanding. Father, thank you for the written word. It stands eternally sure. It is dependable. It is unchanging. It is constant. Thank you for the wisdom it contains. As we expose ourselves to the perfect law of liberty, cause us, O oh God, to have insight and understanding and to be able to apply principles of the word, your word, in our lives. Cause it to change us and be more like our master, Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Amen and amen. God bless you. Second Kings chapter 7. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Then the Lord, on whose hand the king leaned, answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. There were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here till we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come, let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they have us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. And they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said to one another, Lo, the king of Israel had hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. When these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. Then they said one to another, we do not well this day. It's the day of good tidings. We hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come, that we may go and tell the king's household. So they came and called unto the porter of the city. They told them, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of man, but horses tied and asses tied, the tents as they were. And he called the porters, and they told it to the king's house within. And the king arose in the night and said unto his servants, I will now show you what the Syrians have done us. They know that we be hungry. Therefore are they gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, When they come out of the city, we shall catch them alive and get into the city. But one of his servants answered and said, let some take, I pray thee, five of the horses that remain, that which are left in the city. Behold, they are as all the multitude of Israel that are left in it. Behold, I say, they are even as all the multitude of the Israelites that are consumed. Let us send and see. They took therefore two chariot horses, and the king sent after the host of the Syrians, saying, Go and see. And they went after them, unto Jordan, 
And lo, all the way was full of garments and vessels, which the Syrians had cast away in their haste. And the messengers returned and told the king, and the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians. So a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel, two measures of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. And the king appointed the Lord on whose hand he leaned to have charge over the gate. The people trod upon him in the gate, and he died as the man of God had said. He spake when the king came down to him. And it came to pass, as the man of God had spoken to the king, saying, Two measures of barley for a shekel, and a measure of fine flour for a shekel, shall be tomorrow, about this time, in the gate of Samaria. And the Lord answered the man of God, and said, That Lord answered the man of God, and said, Now behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, might such a thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see with thine eyes, but shall not eat thereof. So he fell out unto him, for the people trod upon him in the gate, and he died. Praise God. Chapter 8. Then spake Elisha unto the woman whose son he had restored to life, saying, Arise and go thou and thine household, and sojourn, wheresoever thou canst sojourn. For the Lord hath called for a famine, and it shall also come upon the land seven years. And the woman arose and did after the saying of the man of God, and she went with her household, and sojourned in the land of the Philistines seven years. And it came to pass at the seven years' end, that the woman returned out of the land of the Philistines, and she went forth to cry unto the king for her house and for her land. And the king talked with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, Tell me, I pray thee, all the great things that Elisha had done. And it came to pass, as he was telling the king how he had restored a dead body to life, that behold, the woman whose son he had restored to life cried to the king for her house. And for her land. And Gehazi said, My lord, O king, this is the woman, and this is her son, whom Elisha restored to life. And when the king asked the woman, she told him. So the king appointed unto her a certain officer, saying, Restore all that was hers, and all the fruits of the field since the day that she left the land, even until now. And Elisha came to Damascus, and Ben Hadad, the king of Syria, was sick. And it was told him, saying, The man of God is come hither. And the king said unto Hazael, Take a present in thine hand, and go meet the man of God, and inquire of the Lord by him, saying, Shall I recover this disease? So Hazael went to meet him, and took a present with him, even of every good thing of Damascus, forty camels, burden, and came and stood before him, and said, Thy son, Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, has sent me to thee, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? And Elisha said unto him, Go say unto him, Thou mayest suddenly recover, howbeit the Lord had showed me that he shall surely die. And he settled his countenance steadfastly until he was ashamed, and the man of God wept. And Hazael said, Why weepeth, weepeth my Lord? And he answered, because I know the evil that thou wilt do unto the children of Israel. The strongholds will thou set on fire, their young men will thou slay with a sword, and will dash their children and rip up their women with child. And Hazael said, But what is but what? Is thy servant a dog that he should do this great thing? And Elisha answered, The Lord hath showed me that thou shalt be king over Syria. So he departed from Elisha and came to his master who said unto him, What said Elisha to thee? And he answered, He told me that thou shouldest surely recover. And it came to pass on the morrow that he took a thick cloth and dipped it in water and spread it on his face so that he died. And Hazael reigned in his stead. And in the fifth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, Jehoshaphat being then king of Judah, Jeroham, Jehoram, 
the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, began to reign. Thirty and two years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, as did the house of Ahab. For the daughter of Ahab was his wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Yet the Lord would not destroy Judah for David his servant's sake, as he promised him to give him always a light and to his children. In the days of Edom, revolted from under the hand of Judah and made a king over themselves. So Joram went over to Zaire and all the chariots with him, and he rose by night and smote the Edomites, which compassed him about. Captains of the chariots and the people fled into their tents. Yet Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah unto this day. Then Libna revolted at the same time, and the rest of the acts of Joram and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And Joram slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And Ahaziah, his son, reigned in his stead. The twelfth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, did Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, begin to reign. Twenty and two years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Athaliah, the daughter of Omri, king of Israel. And he walked in the way of the house of Ahab and did evil in the sight of the Lord, as did the house of Ahab. For he was the son-in-law of the house of Ahab. And he went in with Joram, the son of Ahab, to war against Hazael, king of Syria, in Ramoth Gilead. And the Syrians wounded Joram. King Joram went back to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians have given him at Ramah when he fought against Hazael, king of Syria. And Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to see Joram, the son of Ahab, in Jezreel because he was sick. All right, praise God. I'm not going to go over chapter 7 again, chapter 8. Um, the Bible lets us know that Elisha kept in contact with the uh, Shunammite woman whose son he had raised from the dead. Um, he also recalled that he prophesied concerning the birth of the boy, I think in chapter four, uh, when the Shunammite woman said, don't lie to me, man of God. Um, it's not going to happen. But at the time of life, as the man of God had said, uh, she did conceive and bear a son. The boy grew up old enough to be able to leave her in the house and go to the father who was on the farm. And it was while he was on the farm that he had some kind of a headache or something. And he shouted, my father, my head, my head, my head. Long story short, uh, tells his servant to take, her, take him back to his mom. His mom writes to Elisha, brings Elisha back. Elisha prays and raises the boy from the dead, you recall. All right. So Elisha. Uh, somehow kept in touch with this Shunammite woman. And because the Lord had let his servant know that there was going to be famine in the land for seven years, um, he felt obligated to go back and tell her to leave the country and find somewhere that she can live so that she will not be in the famine. And like I told you, do you see the parallels between Elijah's ministry and Elisha's ministry? Because Elisha carried the anointing that was upon Elijah double measure. You can covet the anointing. It's, a, it's allowed. You can desire to have what another man of God has. You see a gift in someone, you, you admire it or you, you desire it. You can ask God for it and he will give it to you. All right. Um, in, in Elijah's time, it was three years of famine dealing with Ahab and Jezebel. In Elisha's time, it was seven years of famine. And if you recall, we looked at Ezekiel chapter 14, I believe it was, where we see the four sore judgments that God um, that God meets on any nation that's in apostasy. Famine is one of them. Wild beasts is another. Uh, war is another. Uh, and I don't rightly remember the fourth one, but it's in Ezekiel chapter 14. 
Um, so we see uh, Elijah warning her. And what that tells us is that God will always give us inside information. Always. He never leaves his own without, um, without some kind of provision, no matter what it is. God will never leave you alone. Doesn't matter what the situation you are in, God will always send help. You just have to position yourself to hear Him and to see His hand moving, even in the midst of the difficulties. Truth be told, Jesus has told us that we will have tribulation, but He told us to be of good cheer because He has overcome the world. He promises us that we too will overcome the world. And if we hold on to His promises, it's just a matter of time before it is fulfilled in our lives. Praise God. And so the woman took the counsel of the man of God and she moved to the land of the Philistines and she dwelt there for the seven years that there was famine in the land of Israel. Because Israel, as we know, was in apostasy. So it's, it's not a wonder that God is sending famine uh, to judge them. At the end of the seven years, the woman returned out of the land of the Philistines and she went to the king to request for all of her property before. Uh, obviously, maybe squatters taking possession of it. Um, we don't know. Uh, but she had reason to go and tell the king to please give her back her property. Um, and the king appointed an officer to uh, make sure that everything that was hers, restore her all that was hers, all the fruit of the field since the day that she left the land even until now. And I'll share a personal testimony here to tell you guys that God's word is infallible. When my family and I moved back to the U.S. in 1993 of April, I did not go back to Nigeria until year 2001. All right? And that's exactly eight years. I went to minister in one of the Redeemed Christian Church of God parishes. And I'm not going to mention the name of the man of God because then you will know which particular parish, but his name is right here in my Bible. And I wrote here, Sunday, March 25th, 2001. Not knowing that I had been gone from Nigeria for eight years. He taught from this scripture and prophesied. He said, if you've lost anything in the last eight years, it was that definite. He said, God said he will restore. The house that I had left, my home that I told you, the man borrowed me his money to buy the house from him, himself. That's the house I'm talking about. Of course, it was run down. It wasn't well used. Um, it cost a lot of money to... I literally had to rebuild it. But structurally, it was compromised. The roof was compromised. Uh, forget about the walls. My white walls were black, you know? Uh, I'm sharing this with you for you to know that God, listen, if you believe God radically, he will answer you radically. I've also testified that I was building a house in this fellowship and I didn't have enough to build it. And what I had in my, my bank account was not going to be enough to finish it. I told you that I wrote a check for the entire amount on a Sunday. And gave it to a man of God that I respect. By Thursday, I got three times what I wrote on that check. And I was able to finish the house. It is this self-same house I'm talking to you about. Be committed, child of God. Be serious with God. The fact that we have issues in our lives, challenges in our lives, doesn't mean we shouldn't give God the utmost. I don't even know how to describe what I'm telling you. Be, be totally 
sold out in your heart for God and in the things of God, if you put God first, the Bible says no good thing will he withhold. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. If you dare to believe God and you hold on to the truth of his word, his hands are literally tied because he's bound by his word and he's bound to do his word so that he doesn't fall to the ground fruitless. I turned around and sold that house. It's not going to make sense to you, but I bought the house for 250,000 Naira. That was when Naira was Naira. It was the exchange rate at that time was like 23 Naira to the dollar. 23 Naira to the dollar. Exchange rate as of this morning is 1470 to the dollar. 1470 Naira to the dollar. This testimony I'm giving you, the dollar was 23 to 1. I bought the house for 250,000 Naira at that time. I sold it for 20 million Naira. And I sold it at the time when the Naira was probably maybe like 100, 105 to 1. Sometimes God will talk some things away from you. You may think you've lost that thing. No. No. You, you'll just find yourself in a place where that thing, whatever it is, will come out of the woodwork and serve the purpose that it's supposed to serve at that material time in your life. David said, I have been young. Now I am old. I have never seen the righteous forsaken. Now his seed begging bread. Look beyond your paycheck. Your paycheck is not what sustains you. It's not, and you know it. You've got to trust God every step of the way. Take every need to him. Because this system is stacked against the believer. That's, that's why they don't pay you what you're worth. You spend thousands of dollars, pounds sterling, or whatever the currency is, to attain that diploma. And then you go to work with that diploma and all the experience and knowledge that you come with, and they pay you pittance. They've got you working husband, working children, working cat, dog, everybody working. It's deliberate. So that you're distracted. And you cannot do for God like you would want to do for God. That's why you have to dig your dig your, your heels in and, and be like, no, it's God, God, God or God. After that, it's God and God again. Because he's the only one. And then you have to be patient because of his timing. His timing is different from our timing. His timing is what? Different from our timing. But God will always come through. He never, ever fails. Elisha came to Damascus. Ben Haddad, the king of Syria, was sick. So he sent word to go and ask if he was going to recover from whatever it was he was uh, healing from. Hazael, whom he sent, went, look at verse 9. He said, Hazael went to meet him and took a present with him, even of every good thing of Damascus, 40 camels laden and came to the man of God. And he said, uh, your son Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, sent me to you saying, will I recover from this disease? And Elisha said, yes, go and tell him he will recover. However, God has showed me that he will surely die. 
He settled his countenance steadfastly until he was ashamed. Really, the word is not ashamed. It should it should have been uh, translated as uh, in deep sorrow. All right. And the man of God wept. He, he, he was so, he was in such pain by the news that even Elisha was moved to tears. As I asked him, why are you crying? And then he said, because I know the evil that you will do to the children of Israel. Because God showed him that much. Uh, how you will uh, destroy their strongholds, set it on fire. Their young men you will slay with the sword. Uh, you will dash their children and rip up their women with child. How many of you heard about October 7th last year? And some of the atrocities that were committed? There's a gentleman whose video I watched. I don't readily remember his name. I just stumbled on it. And it interested me because he was he was speaking firsthand about what happened. That they took pregnant women, cut them open, brought the baby out, and stabbed the baby to death. They raped women. You see, all these young people that are out there, all these 35 and under, all these college kids, 25 and under, 20-year-olds, who are totally clueless, who don't know history or don't even know the word. I don't condone violence, not by any stretch of anyone's imagination. I'm not a violent person. I don't condone it. But, but what kind of spirit would possess a human being? First of all, you are a man. A woman can't fight you. She's helpless in your grip. Then you will cut her open with a dagger. She's not dead. She's alive. She can feel the pain. You cut the sack open. You bring out the child. You stab the child to death. What kind of spirit is at work? And how do you justify that? I don't know the root cause of the conflict, but whatever it may be, what happened to those however many hundreds of people in the kibbutz that was attacked, there are no words to describe it. It's, it's beyond inhuman. And this is exactly what they did. It came out of the book. And I'm going to go look in my Quran as soon as we're done. I'm sure this verse of scripture is also in the Quran. Because everything they do is from the Quran. whether they like it or not, from Lebanon to Ethiopia into West Africa, that's the size of land God gave Abraham and his seed forever. And God is not a man that he should lie. When he comes back to reign Jesus Christ as the king over this earth, everything will be restored because there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Azael did not believe. He said to Elisha, what, what are you saying? That I will dash their women to pieces? I will... No, what are you saying? Am I a dog that I will do such atrocious things? Verse 13, and Azael said, but what is thy servant? A dog that he should do this great thing? And Elisha answered, the Lord has shown me that thou shalt be king over Syria. When you become king, you will do these things that I'm prophesying. He departed from Elisha. He came to his master. As Ben Haddad, uh, who said to him, What did Elisha say? And he gave him the response that Elisha said, You would recover. It came to pass on the uh, next morning, he took a, dip, a, a thick cloth, 
dipped it in water, spread it on his face, and he killed himself. So uh, Hazael reigned in his stead. Fifth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel. Jehoshaphat at that time was king in Judah. Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, uh, king of Judah, began to reign. All right, you recall we read that he didn't have a son. So Jehoshaphat sent his son to go and reign in the northern kingdom. Thirty and two years old was he when he began to reign. He reigned eight years in Jerusalem, walked in the way of the kings of Israel. That means he did evil because all the kings of Israel did evil. All right, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Um, he was a son-in-law in that household. Right? The daughter of Ahab was his wife. And so he followed the way of Ahab and Jezreel and did evil in the sight of the Lord. But because the Lord had a covenant with David, our God is a covenant-keeping God. And if I were you, I will constantly invoke the tokens of any covenant that I have with God. Because he's a covenant-keeping God. You got to learn how to pray. Because praying is like arguing your case in a courthouse. Arguing your case in the heavenly courts. Why God should do what you're saying he should do. You must present evidence. You must present facts. You must have precedence. That's how to pray. And that's how to tie the hands of God. Figuratively speaking, because he has no choice but to do his word. Don't, don't, don't settle. Don't. I know someone who jokingly said he was beginning to lose his hair. And he was using all kinds of things because he didn't want to go bald. And he made a comment that I just remembered now. He said, I'm going to fight baldness to the last follicle. <laughs> That's how you should be in the place of prayer. I am not going to stop praying about an issue until God moves. I understand and I recognize that he doesn't dwell in time. So he's not bound by my little clock on my wall. The Bible says a day is like a thousand years before the Lord. A thousand years is like a day before the Lord. So where I'm groaning after two years of believing God for something, after seven years of believing God for something, it may just be a moment in the eyes of God. So I'm not going to stand and trust God for something based on my watch. No, I, I acknowledge that he's God, he sees all things, he knows all things. He's, he stands outside of time because time is a little portion of eternity. Eternity past, eternity future, dateless. But a small portion, he took it out, he called it time. He gave it to man to use. He gave it to us to use. That's why he's going to wrap up time. When you die, you step out of time, you step into eternity. So time doesn't really matter. Don't be counting days and months for God. Just stand in faith and be stubbornly, ridiculously faithful. And because he knows your entire life from, he, he said before you were formed in your mother's womb, he knew you. He knows your entire life. So he knows when to bring whatever into your life. Just trust him that he's got you and he's, Everything he's doing is for your good. The Bible says all things work together. All things, even negative things, all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to purpose. So why should I despair? Why should I worry? Why should I be concerned? That's not to say those negative feelings won't come. That's not to say you won't have down days. And you may be silly enough to want to indulge the flesh. 
But you better be sensible enough to put a time limit on that your pity party. He keeps covenants. And in spite of what all of these crazy kings were doing, the Bible says, yet the Lord will not destroy Judah for David his servant's sake, as he promised him to give him always a light, always a presence, always a loophole, always a, some respite, always something that you can see and hold on to. He will never abandon you. Never. I don't care how tight it is. Always a light and to his descendants, his children. All right? In those days, the Bible says the children of Edom decided to revolt against the king of Judah, of course, because he wasn't doing right. And when you're not doing right, when you're not applying wisdom to your life, you're like a city, what does the Bible say? With broken down walls. And when a city's wall is broken down, the city becomes defenseless. Any and anybody and everybody can come in and tramp, trample over it. So they, they revolted. When Libna saw that Edom had revolted and they got away with it, they too revolted. And then the Bible says the rest of the acts of Joram we will come across in the book of uh, Chronicles. Joram slept with his fathers, was buried with his fathers in the city of David, and Ahaziah, his own son, reigned in his stead. The Bible backtracks a little bit and talks about the 12th year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel. Ahaziah, the son of Joram, king of Judah, began to reign in Judah. 20 and 2 years old was he when he began to reign. He reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Athaliah was the daughter of Omri, king of Israel. He walked in the way of the house of Ahab, did evil in the sight of the Lord, as did the house of Ahab, for he was the son-in-law of the house of Ahab. He went with Joram, the son of Ahab, to war against Hazael, the king of Syria, at Ramoth Gilead, and the Syrians wounded Joram. That's how he died. He went back to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians had given him, at Ramath Gilead fought against Hazael, king of Syria. Ahaziah, the son of Joram, king of Judah, went down to see Joram, the son of Ahab, in Jezreel because he was sick. Right? Any questions on chapter 8? Any thoughts? Any comments? All right, chapter 9. And Elisha the prophet called one of the children of the prophets and said unto him, Gird up thy loins and take this box of oil in thine hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. And when thou comest thither, look out there Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshai, and go in and make him rise up from among his brethren and carry him to an inner chamber and take the box of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. Then open the door and flee, and tarry not. So the young man, even the young man, the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. And when he came, behold, the captains of the host were sitting. And he said, I have an errand to thee, O captain. And Jehu said, Unto which of us all? And he said, To thee, O captain. And he arose and went into the house. And he poured the oil on his head and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed thee king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. Thou shalt smite the house of Ahab thy master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up, and left in Israel. And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, or like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah. And the dogs shall and the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the portion of Jezreel. There shall be none to bury her. And he opened the door and fled. 
Then Jehu came forth to the servants of his Lord, and one said unto him, Is all well? Wherefore came this mad fellow to thee? And he said unto them, Ye know the man and his communication. And they said, It is false. Tell us now. And he said, Thus and thus speak he to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. And they hasted and took every man his garment and put it under him on the top of the stairs and blew the trumpet, saying, Jehu is king. So Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Joram. Now Joram had kept Ramoth Gilead, he and all Israel, because of Haza, Hazael, king of Syria. But King Joram was, was returned to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians had given him when he fought with Hazael, king of Syria. Jehu said, If it be your minds, then let none go forth nor escape out of the city to go tell it in Jezreel. So Jehu rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel. But Joram lay there, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, was come down to see Joram. And there stood a watchman on the tower in Jezreel. And he spied the company of Jehu as he came and said, I see a company. And Joram said, Take an horseman and send to meet him. Let him say, Is it peace? So there went one on horse back to meet him and said, Thus saith And Jehu said, What hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. And the watchman told, saying, The messenger came to them, but he cometh not again. Then he sent out a second on horseback, which came to them and said, Thus saith the king, Is it peace? And Jehu answered, What hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. And the watchman told, saying, He came even unto them, and cometh not again. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he driveth furiously. And Joram said, Make ready. And his char chariot was made ready. And Joram, king of Israel, and Isaiah, king of Judah, went out each in his chariot, and they went out against Jehu, and met him in the portion of Naboth, the Jezreelite. And it came to pass, when Joram saw Jehu, that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace? So long as the whoredoms of my of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. And Joram turned his hands and fled, and said to Ahaziah, There is treachery, O Ahaziah. And Jehu drew a bow with his full strength, and smote Jehoram between his arms, and the arrow went out at his heart, and he sunk down in his chariot. Then said Jehu to Bidkar, his captain, take up and cast him in the portion of the field of Naboth, the Jezreelites. For remember how that when I and thou rode together after Ahab, his father, the Lord laid this burden upon him. Surely I have seen yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his son, said the Lord, and I will requite thee in this plat, said the Lord. Now therefore take and cast him into the plat of ground, according to the word of the Lord. But when Ahaziah the king of Judah saw this, he fled by the way of the garden house. And Jehu followed after him and said, Smite him also in the chariot. And they did so at the going up of Go, which is by Ibleam. And he fled to Megiddo and died there. And his servants carried him in the chariot to Jerusalem and buried him in his sepulchre with his fathers in the city of David. And in the eleventh year of Joram, the son of Ahab, began Ahaziah to reign over Judah. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and, and tired her head and looked out a window. And as Jehu entered in at the gate, she said, At Zimri peace, who slew his master? And he lifted up his face to the window and said, who is on my side? Who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs. And he said, throw her down. So they threw her down. And some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses. And he trod her underfoot. And when he was coming, 
they did eat and drink and said, Go see now a disgusted woman and, and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. And they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hand. Wherefore they came again and told him, and he said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servant Elijah, the Tishbite, saying, In the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel, and of the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung upon the face of the field, in the portion of Jezreel, so that they shall not say, This is Jezebel. All right. A lot of it historical and informational. Talks about how you was anointed. And if you recall when we were studying Elijah's ministry, at the time that God was going to cause there to be a change of guards, if you like, God told Elijah to go and anoint Jehoshaphat to be king, Jehu to be king, and Elisha to reign in his stead. So we see the prophecy that God gave Elijah coming to pass and being executed by his um, successor, Elisha. All right. He calls uh, one of the children of the prophets, sends him forth to go look for um, Jehu to anoint him so that the word of God will come to pass and not fall to the ground. He told him where he would find him that he would be in the company of his buddies and that he should pour him out and give him the message concerning his anointing and then go ahead and anoint him and then he quickly leave the place. That's exactly what the young man did. Um, looking for any other points that I want to bring out. We have seen that God's word never falls to the ground fruitless. Even though the one by whom he prophesied had died, God still ensured that what he had prophesied came to pass. That's why all of these guys that are running around and calling themselves prophets, they tire me to no end. Don't throw a fistful of gravel and one pebble hits part of the mark. You call yourself a prophet. If you're a prophet, give us a thus said the Lord. That even a child that witnesses it will say this is God. We talk about the prophetic, the prophetic, the prophetic. There's no prophecy that, that's greater than this book. This is the whole prophecy of God. And if you cannot find what you need in this book, you're certainly not going to find it in the mouth of a man. Don't care if he's dripping oil out of every orifice of his body. The word first. Even prophecies should be subjected to the word so that you can confirm that it is the word of the Lord. Or Satan can prophesy. There's really nothing else that I want to point out other than the veracity of the word of God. If it's a, if it's something God said and a man prophesies it, I use the word man in a generic sense, it will come to pass even if the man has died a hundred years ago. You can trust that it will come to pass. The same way that Jezebel, that Elijah said Jezebel would die, that's exactly how she died. After she engineered the coveting and the, and the seizure of Naboth's vineyard, and, and orchestrated his, his murder, because that's what it was, so that she could take the vineyard for Elisha. And Elijah told, told um, Ahab, said the same place that dogs licked the blood of Naboth, God will, uh, dogs will lick, lick the blood of Jezebel. And that's exactly what happened. Um, Elisha came and accorded her song respect because she was a princess, she was the daughter of a king. He commanded that they pick her up and go and bury her and not just leave her to rot in the streets. Uh, when they went there, they didn't find 
her whole body because dogs had eaten her. Like Elijah prophesied, they found um, the skull, found the feet, and they found the palm of her hands. Came back and told Elisha what they saw, and Elisha confirmed that this is the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servant Elijah, saying, In the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezreel. And that's exactly what happened. Any thoughts, any comments? Any questions? Come on, class. Pastor, this is really good. Um, I'm at work. But I am, am so encouraged by this word. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Bless you. Give me one quick second, please. Uh, I do believe we have uh, time for one more chapter. It's about 10.30 now. So let's let's take chapter ten. And he have had seventy sons in Samaria, and Jehu wrote letters and sent to Samaria unto the rulers of Jezreel, to the elders, and to them that brought up Ahab's children, saying, Now as soon as this letter cometh to you, seeing your master's sons are with you, and there are with you chariots and horses, a fenced city also, and armor. Look even out the best and meetest of your master's sons and set him on his father's throne and fight for your master's house. But they were exceedingly afraid and said, Behold, two kings stood not before him. How then shall we stand? And he that was over the house and he that was over the city, the elders also, and the bringers up of the children sent to Jehu, saying, We are thy servants. I will do all that thou shalt bid us. We will not make any king. Do thou that which is good in thine eyes. Then he wrote a letter the second time to them, saying, If ye be mine, and if ye will hearken unto my voice, take ye the heads of the men of your master's sons, and come to me to Jezreel by tomorrow this time. Now the king's sons, being seventy persons, were with the great men of the city which brought them up. And it came to pass, when the letter came to them, that they took the king's sons and slew seventy persons and put their heads in baskets and sent him them to Jezreel. And there came a messenger and told him, saying, They have brought the heads of the king's sons. And he said, Lay ye them in two heaps at the entering in of the gate until the morning. And it came to pass in the morning that he went out and stood and said to all the people, Ye be righteous. Behold, I conspired against my master and slew him. But who slew all these? Know now that there shall fall unto the earth nothing of the word of the Lord, which the Lord spake concerning the house of Ahab. But the Lord had done that which he spake by his servant Elijah. So Jehu slew all that remained of the house of Ahab in Jezreel, and all his great men and his kinsfolks and his priests, until he left them none remaining. And he arose and departed and came to Samaria. And as he was at the sharing house in the way, Jehu met with the brethren of Ahaziah king of Judah and said, Who are ye? And they answered, We are the brethren of Ahaziah, and we go down to salute the children of the king and the children of the queen. And he said, Take them alive. And they took them alive and slew them at the pit of the sharing house, even to and forty men, neither left he any of them. When he was departed thence, he lighted on Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him, and he saluted him and said to him, Is thine heart right, as my heart is with thine heart? And Jehonadab answered, It is. If it be, give me thine hand. And he gave him his hand, and he took him up to him into the chariot. And he said, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So they made him ride in his chariot. And he came to Samaria, 
He slew all that remained unto Ahab in Samaria, till he had destroyed him according to the saying of the Lord which he spake to Elijah. And Jehu gathered all the people together and said unto them, Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu shall serve him much. Now therefore call unto me all the prophets of Baal, all his servants, and all his priests. Let none be wanting. I have a great sacrifice to do to Baal. Whosoever shall be wanting, he shall not live. But Jehu did it subtly to the intent that he might destroy the worshippers of Baal. Jehu said, Proclaim a solemn assembly for Baal. And they proclaimed it. And Jehu sent through all Israel and all the worshippers of Baal came, so that there was not a man left that came not. And they came into the house of Baal, and the house of Baal was full from one end to another. And he said unto him, that was over the vestry, Bring forth vestments for all the worshippers of Baal. And he brought them forth vestments. And Jehu went, and Jehunab, the son of Rechab, into the house of Baal, and said unto the worshippers of Baal, Search and look, that there be here with you none of the servants of the Lord, but the worshippers of Baal only. And when they went in to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings, Jehu appointed fourscore men without, and said, If any of the men whom I have brought into your hands escape, he that let him go, his life shall be for his life of him. And it came to pass, as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, that Jehu said to the guard and to the captains, Go in and slay them. Let none come forth. And they smote them to the edge of the sword, and the guard and the captains cast them out and went to the city of the house of Baal. They brought forth the images out of the house of Baal and buried them. And they break down the image of Baal and break down the house of Baal and made it a draft house unto this day. Thus Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel, Abid, from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, Jehu departed not from after them, to wit the golden calves that were in Bethel uh, and that were in Dan. And the Lord said unto Jehu, Because thou hast done well in executing that which is right in mine eyes, and hast done unto the house of Ahab according to all that was in mine heart, thy children of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord, God of Israel, with all his heart, for he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. In those days the Lord began to cut short, cut Israel short, and Hazael smote them in all the coasts of Israel. For Jordan, from Jordan eastward, all the land of Gilead, the Gadites, and the Reubenites, and the Manassites, from Arua, which is by the river, Arnon, even Gilead, and Bashan. Now the rest of the acts of Jehu, and all that he did, and all his might, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? And Jehu slept with his fathers, and they buried him in Samaria, and Jehu Ahaz, his son, reigned in his stead. And the time that Jehu reigned over Israel in Samaria was twenty and eight years. Praise God. I can sum this entire chapter up with one sentence. Basically, what Jehu did was to excise sin from the land. Although he made the mistake of retaining the sin that um, what's his name? Not Jehoshaphat, the other king. It will come to me. He made the mistake of retaining the sins of uh, that, that particular king. Jeroboam. Jeroboam. Yes, Jeroboam. All right. He made the mistake. And this is the first time I am seeing, although I've read this many times, this is the first time I am seeing the particular reference. Because the Bible will always say uh, the sins, Jerome, sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. 
sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. I did not connect it until I saw it in this chapter now, that it was in particular the two golden calves that he erected, one in Dan and one in Bethel. You remember when the uh, kingdom split after Solomon's reign? Rehoboam, his son, reigned over the southern kingdom, Judah and Benjamin. Jeroboam reigned over the ten northern kingdoms. Do you remember when he met with uh, Elijah and his garment was ripped into uh, several pieces and ten was given to him and the prophecy came that he would, he would reign over the northern kingdom? Because he, he did not wholly trust God. If God prophesied to you by his servant that you're going to reign over ten tribes, the God who said that is he not capable of bringing it to pass? That you will have to try to figure out a way to do what God has said. You're not God. Don't try to figure it out. You couldn't even if you tried. He should have trusted the God who said, I'm going to make you king over the ten northern kingdoms. But he didn't trust God and he was fearful that if he would allow the people to go to Shiloh, the temple that Solomon had built, then their hearts and their affections will begin to lean towards Rehoboam, who was a biological child. And he would then lose the ten northern kingdoms that he was supposed to reign over. He did not believe God. And he did not trust God. Because if he believed God and he trusted in God, he would not have had any need. He then went and made two golden calves. The very same thing that God said not to do. Because oral tradition and history must have taught him that they did this in Horeb and God was vexed. So he made two golden calves, put one in Dan, put one in Bethel, the uppermost part of his kingdom and the lowest part of his kingdom. And he said to them, guys, don't bother to go to Jerusalem. These be your gods that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So specifically, that was the sin. I see that now. All right? He, 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 he tricked the people, everybody that was a worshiper of Baal in Israel. He told them, I want to worship Baal, and everybody must be present. If you, if you don't come, you're going to die. So he, he did that, and it was a good thing in the sight of the Lord because he completely excised the worship of Baal. But the two golden cows that were still erected in Bethel and Dan, he didn't pull down, which he should have. Because the people kept going there to make sacrifices, and that continued to vex God. So like I said, if I'm going to sum this entire chapter up in one sentence, no tolerance for sin. Zero tolerance for sin. Zero tolerance. That's not to say you and I will not, will not sin because we're still in the flesh. And Satan knows where to get each one of us. There are things he will never tempt me with. He knows he, he, knows he can't. It won't work. But there are areas that he can bring temptation along my way. That's why I have to remain sensitive to the spirit of God. And I have to keep practicing the presence of God. What do I mean by that? A consciousness that God is right beside me. A constant, I never lose sight of the fact that God is with me. That's why I'm fearless. I know he's with me. And if anything happens to me, he has allowed it. And he has allowed it because he knows I can handle it. I have children. I will never put a burden on them beyond what they can bear. And God won't do the same thing. He won't do that to us. All right? So he tricks them. He brings them all into one house, just like Samson did with the Philistines. Got rid of all of them in one fell swoop. That's exactly what we see Jehu doing. Elijah had prophesied that those that Jehoshaphat killed and leave 
behind Jehu is coming to kill. And that's exactly what we see happening. He gathered all the people together that served Baal and he dealt with them. Verse 19 tells us that he did it sub subtly to the intent that he might destroy the worshippers of Baal. Complete excision of sin in your life. Even a thought, rebuke it immediately. Don't let it go beyond that. Because sometimes you can't stop thoughts from coming. But you certainly can't stop them from saying, staying. One man of God said, I can't stop birds from flying over my head. But I can stop them from building their nests on my head. So the thought can come. That's why in 1 Corinthians 10.5. He says, cast down every imagination, cast it down, every imagination that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. Which presupposes the fact that you must have the knowledge of God concerning that situation. What has God said to you about that situation? So that when that situation arises, the word of God can arise. The Bible says when the enemy comes, like a flood, the Spirit of God will lift up a standard. There must always be a standard in your spirit. And that standard is the word. So that no matter what the enemy brings, no matter how it feels like, no matter what it looks like, no matter. Okay? So Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel. How be it? That particular sin of Jeroboam, which the Bible tells us, the two uh, golden calves. Verse 29. How be it from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin? He made Israel to sin because he put those two calves there and he told them, don't go to the south anymore. Go and worship where those two calves are. Jehu did not depart from them to the extent that those golden calves were left still standing. Child of God, is there any idol in your life? Any idol? Could be that hurt from something someone did to you that has become an idol because you're nursing it and you're still dwelling on it and you're still talking about it and you're still remembering it. It has become an idol. An idol doesn't mean me bowing down to some shrine or at some shrine or to some effigy or whatever. No. What have you exalted in your heart above God? See, the Bible tells us that the heart is desperately, desperately deceitful and wicked. Then it says, who can know it? That means your heart can deceive you. No, no, I'm not. I'm not angry with him anymore. No, no, uh, he just needs to, you know, let him go his way and I go my way. No, you are in unforgiveness. Period. End of story. I don't care how you color it. Well, I, I've read a book that says uh, we need to set boundaries. Yes, we need to set boundaries. But the line between you setting boundaries and unforgiveness is very thin. Very, very thin. You need to know in your mind that it is truly a boundary because I'm not going to allow someone to walk all over me. That's what they mean by boundaries. But I'm also not going to be careless enough where my boundary is no longer boundary, it is unforgiveness. If the name of that person is mentioned and you feel some kind of way, there's a problem. We need to guard our hearts diligently, diligently, diligently. For from it flows the weighty matters of life. All right. God said to Jehu, you've done well in executing what is right in my sight. I have not done what the house of Ahab is doing. I will grant that 
four generations after you will sit on the uh, on the throne of Israel. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all of his heart, for he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. That is to say, not that Jehu was sinning, or because he didn't remove those two golden calves. He didn't put the calves there. He didn't worship the calves. As a matter of fact, he eradicated the worship of Baal. But look, it was counting against him that he didn't do something about iniquity. He cannot play with sin. Not in any measure. That's all, that's all it takes for the door to be opened and for the enemy to have a right of way. That's why practicing the presence of God is important. Walk around with a consciousness. If you have to say it to yourself one gazillion times until it sinks into your spirit, keep saying it to yourself. I'm not alone. The Lord is with me. I don't walk alone. Jesus is right on this. You cannot be thinking and saying that and consider sin at the same time. It's impossible. When you live any old way, any careless way, you wake up, yeah, you do your small devotion with your daily bread. And I'm not knocking a daily bread, thank God for daily bread is You don't take the time to pray, you don't take the time to, to set your plate down. You don't say every Friday I'm going to consecrate or every Tuesday or every Sunday. I don't care. You, you don't have something definite that you're doing that's saying to God, I am following after you and I am pursuing you. You have to. We're surrounded by evil. We are completely surrounded by evil. Television is horrible. Social media is horrible. News is horrible. Even people in that you that you hang out with in college, wherever that you are, people on the job. Someone just hates you because of your performance. And looking for a way to set you up or trip you up or, or let the supervisor know this, that, and the other. She doesn't say we're in the world, but we're not of it. Must remember this at all times, at all times, and it's by practicing the presence of God, knowing that He's with me, sets a guard on my lips. Knowing that He's with me, curbs where I can go to and where I cannot go to. Knowing that He's with me, tells me this person cannot be in my company. We have to be that radical. People who worship Satan are radical. It used to be that they hid. But now they are right in our faces and they are doing what they want. They are even training our children. I saw one picture on social media where they drew a pentagram on the floor of the classroom in a classroom. How many have seen it? It's on social media. They drew a pentagram on the floor. And you know what the pentagram is? The five-sided, uh, five-pointed star that looks like a goat head. That's the satanic symbol. They drew it on the floor. They had the children sit around it. And the satanist was sitting on the chair. It was a picture, so I don't, I can't tell you what the interaction was, but they, they say picture speaks more than a thousand words. It's all around us, people of God. That's why we've got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in other tongues, don't stop. I'm walking down the street. I'm speaking in tongues. I'm riding my bike. I'm speaking in tongues. I listen to my, my audio Bible while I'm riding. And indirectly, I'm putting the word forth in my neighborhood. We just, we, we, we just have to be creative in the ways that we take dominion and authority. Nobody touched Dagon before he fell in front of the Ark of the Covenant. 
You remember Samson's story? So in my neighborhood, anybody that's practicing witchcraft or practicing whatever, they have a surprise coming. Because one day, there will be a showdown in the heaven. It's not necessarily with me and them. But we will know whose God is Lord in this neighborhood. We have to be bold. Not confrontational, but we have to be bold. We have to know who we are, what we carry. We have to know what our assignment is. Right? That was the mistake he made. He didn't take down those two cows, even though he did everything right. Questions, thoughts, or comments? Why did he remove everything? He destroyed like every single thing, did everything God told him to do, but then he did not remove the cows. I, I want to say it didn't occur to him, or maybe he thought it didn't matter. Mm. You know, but the, the ignorance is not an excuse before the law, whether spiritual or physical. That's why we, we must walk circumspectly. We can't walk any. We're not ordinary people anymore, ordinary persons anymore. We're not. And from the time you were born till whenever you got born again, you learned wrong. Period. End of story. You learned wrong. It's after you got saved and you started to study the word of God and you got the Holy Spirit on the inside of you that you began to learn who you truly are. That's why that old man must remain dead. The Bible says we should crucify the works of the flesh. Praise God for everyone. Any other thoughts or comments or questions? I think you answered when well, you did answer my question um, so that the responsibility, even if we don't know, we're not uh, re exempted for we're not resolved of, of the ignorance that we don't know the blood is still on our hands. Huh. You have no reason not to know the word is there. Why aren't you in it? The Holy Ghost is on the inside of you. Why aren't you listening to him? We have no excuse. None. Romans chapter 1. But thou art inexcusable, O man. It's there. Thank you, Lord. Any other comments or thoughts? All right, let's bring our study to a close. Thank you, Lord God. All right, let's bring our study to a close. No one has anything else to say. Our Father and our God, thank you for your word. Spirit of God, thank you for being our teacher. That you would keep these things in the consciousness of our minds. That it would become first nature. Not just something we think about after. 
that our lives may be pleasing to you. Also, Paul wrote, he said, we have become epistles that are known and read. And indeed, the world is reading the church. What are they seeing, Father? What are they hearing? What is the image that we're projecting? Because no one in their right minds will reject the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you really knew him for who he is. It's the caricature and the imagery that we have presented. That's why he's not attracted. Lord, forgive us of our shortcomings. And help us. The Bible tells us that we are predestined. That was and is still the mind of God. Predestined to be conformed to the image of your son. That's the goal. When they see us, they see Jesus. When they hear us, they hear him. That we're able ambassadors of his kingdom. In our lives and through our lives, Father, we are proud. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege that we have to break every morning. It is a privilege because there have been many nations where they cannot even own a Bible. Because of open the Bible to. We do not take these things for granted, Lord. We are grateful. Continue to work in us both to will and to do of your good pleasure. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for coming. And I will see you tomorrow when we will continue with chapter 11. Thank you, Spirit of God. Amen and amen. Job chapter 5, verse 12. Our announcements remain the same. We're getting ready to leave on the 10th of July. Uh, there are letters available that you can ask for. The fellowship for funds. Our budget is 9000 we serve a God of abundance. He can do exceedingly, exceeding abundantly above what we're asking for. I'm trusting God that we will raise beyond even that 9,000. Right? I haven't checked lately. I will check with Jay to see how we're doing. And uh, I do believe we have a, a post on Instagram where we want to kind of keep tabs how we're doing. So don't restrict God to your own finances. God can raise one person to write one check for that 9,000. He can't. He can't. So don't think about your pockets, your bank accounts. The Bible says he gives seed to the soul and bread to the eater. He will give that seed. You just have to look beyond the limitations of your pocket. Right? Father, we thank you for the instruction that you gave us almost two years ago concerning Job 5.12. Lord, we put it upon our lips and we speak it with boldness and much assurance that it will prosper what we're sending it to and it will accomplish the purpose of which it sent it out. To the north, we say, God disappoints, God disappoints the, devices the devices of the crafty, crafty so that, their hands, so that their hands cannot perform their, their enterprise. enterprise. 
to the south we say God, God is the point that the bags of the craft, craft is so that their hands yeah, their cannot hands perform, perform their enterprise. Their enterprise. Yeah. Father, we employ the east wind of God, that is the wind you would use to destroy. And we pray concerning every work of Satan and every dastardly thing that man and demons and devils are doing, let the east wind blow. Destroy every installation, every lab, every building, every 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 house where people are held against their will. Everything that's contrary to your will, your plan, and your purpose for the church and for your creation. To the east, we say, God, finally, Lord, to the west, we say. You discipline the devices, devices of the craft so that their hands, so hands, hands, hands cannot perform their enterprise. enterprise. Thus you caused it to be written. Thus we have spoken. It is running and it shall be done. In mm. Jesus' name, amen. 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 See you tomorrow.